Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you. It's great to see you all, and I really appreciate you stopping by. Uh, just as a few quick housekeeping rules, uh, we're asking for attendees to remain on mute until the Q&A session, uh, which will be directly after today's presentation. Uh, I wanted to also make mention that this session will be recorded. Uh, you see that indicated on your top left Zoom screen. Uh, we also recognize that this is a lunch hour for many, um, so please feel free to enjoy your lunch on camera, off camera, no worries at all. Again, uh, thank you all for taking the time to stop by. Uh, my name is Kyle Tribble, and I serve as Director of Culture and Engagement here at the District's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the Equity and Practice series. Uh, but before we jump in, uh, I think it may be important to briefly step back uh, and explain exactly what the Equity and Practice series is and what we aim to do with this series. Uh, so the Equity and Practice series is a collection of community learning opportunities hosted by the School District's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and the Equity Coalition uh, in collaboration with community-based organizations that are focused on equity, cultural awareness, and social justice. Uh, so basically in this series, community-based organizations will highlight their organization services, their resources, their connection to equity, along with best practices that promote equitable change. So the goal of this series is to establish a community of learning between the SDP community uh, and community-based organizations that will promote collective learning and collective action that leads to equitable change throughout the city of Philadelphia. And we definitely want to start with historically marginalized communities and populations. For today's session, we are excited to welcome the Council on American Islamic Relations, which is no, also known as CARE Philadelphia. So CARE is a nonprofit 501c3 grassroots civil rights advocacy group and is America's largest Islamic civil liberties group and, reg and has regional offices nationwide. Uh, their mission is to enhance the understanding of Islam protect civil liberties, promote justice, and empower American Muslims. At this time, I want to take the time to, all, to welcome and uh, uh, welcome our presenters from CARE Philadelphia today. Uh, first, we have Asiya Jones, uh, who serves as CARE's uh, Youth Leadership and Advocacy Project Coordinator. Also supporting Asiya uh, in today's presentation is George Lane. George is a 10th grader at Sankofa Freedom Academy and serves as an intern at CARE Philadelphia. I see you in George. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we definitely appreciate you taking the time out to share this valuable information. And with that, I hand it over to you. I see you can take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kyle. And hello, everyone. Um, my name is Asia Jones, and then I have George with me. And you guys, I want to share my screen. Can you see it? Everything good, perfect. All right, so assalamualaikum everyone. Hello, my name is Asia. Um, I'm from CARE Philadelphia, and this is our Equity and Practice Educator's Guide to Islamic Religious Practice series. So again, what is CARE Philadelphia? Uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, is the largest uh, American Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization in the United States. Its mission is to enhance the understanding of Islam, protect civil rights, uh, promote justice and empower American Muslims. And then our CARE Philadelphia's vision is to be a leading advocate for justice and mutual understanding. So in this picture, you just see some of the things that we do. Uh, we have civil rights advocacy, civic engagement, educational programs. We uh, do a lot of combating and media bias, interfaith outreach, and then youth leadership. All right, just to give a little bit of context on like, what is Islam, what do we believe in? Um, so Islam believes Allah, we believe in Allah, which is just the Arabic word for God. Um, Muslim believe that they worship the same God in all Abrahamic faiths. Um, we also believe in prophets. Uh, so Muslims believe in all the prophets in the Old Testament, Torah, such as Adam, Noah, Moses, and Jesus, peace be upon them all. Um, and then we believe in the Holy Quran. So, uh, this is the word of God revealed to Prophet Muhammad through the angel Jibril. Uh, and this picture is an example of the Quran. Um, and then we believe in the day of judgment. So basically, Muslims believe that everyone will be accountable for their deeds uh, while they were alive. Um, now we're going to look at just some demographics. It's very hard to find like demographics on right now. Um, the last census was in 2020, so a lot of that was pulled from there. 
Um, but due to uh, from Pew Research, um, as you can see, the, the Muslim population has been growing steadily. In 2007, it was at 2.3 uh, 2.35 million, and then it continued to grow. And with the estimate that 2020 was going to be at 3.85 million, um, and then we'll see the next census data. I think is 2024. So we'll kind of see where that has been. Um, as far as the age range for Muslims, um, as you can see that within the age, like starting at 55, it continues to grow um, compared to the US general population with a um, median age of 35 years old uh, for the average Muslim. And then again, just another chart that kind of shows the growth of Muslims uh, throughout the year from Pew Research. Um, next. So basically, uh, as far as the ethnically, ethnically diverse faith, uh, we're very uh, diverse in faith. Uh, this research by ISPU kind of did a poll and they showed that from that 28% of Muslims identified as Black or African American, 23% uh, were Asian descent, 19% were uh, white descent, 14% uh, Arab, 8% Hispanic, 2% Native American, American Indian, and 5% identified as other. So now I want to do some uh, common misconceptions about Islam, whether some of these may have heard, uh, some come up in the media, things like that. So just kind of clearing up some of the most common ones. Um, so number one is that all or most Muslims are from the Middle East. Um, globally, only one in five Muslims are from the Middle East. Um, the largest Muslim populations are in Africa and Asia. Um, in the United States, more than 60% of Muslim Americans are immigrants. Um, and then American Muslims are eth ethnically and racially diverse as the American population, with 28% of American Muslims identifying as Asian, 20% as Black, and 8% as Hispanic. Another common misconception is that the term Allahu Akbar indicates imminent danger. Um, so Allahu Akbar actually translates to Allah is the greatest, and it's usually used as a celebration of life for example, a birth, um, and then it's really used to indicate gratitude and to celebrate God's greatness. Um, number three uh, is that Islam oppresses women. Uh, most oppression of women that receives attention, especially in the media, uh, as being portrayed by Muslims is not necessarily related to their adherence to Islam, but rather tied to local customs and traditions. Um, Muslim women have, have held high leadership positions and Muslim majority countries, including president and prime minister. Um, and then Islam forbids violence of any kind towards women and promotes care for widows, orphans, and the poor. And then the Quran supports the equal status of men and women, stating that women have rights over men, similar to men over women. Um, and then the last one is that Muslims are particularly prone to violence and or support terrorism. Um, according to a recent poll, 41% of Americans believe Islam is more likely than other re religions to encourage violence among its followers. Um, this belief is substantiated by data, and the vast majority of Muslims around the world are people, individuals who suffer from violence and terrorism much more than non-Muslims. All right, now I want to uh, pass it over to our intern, George Lane. He's done a survey with some amazing work that helped to influence one why we're here today. George. So good morning. My name is George Lane. So uh, in the in last summer uh, from August 9th um, to August 16th, I created a survey just basically acknowledging the student voice of Muslim students in the Philadelphia School District. Um, my reason in being for it was the gain insight into which how we are limited. Like a lot of times, just being around my peers and around other people of my age that were Muslim, they always express the, they always express complaints about feeling like uh, the religion wasn't acknowledged enough compared to other religions, such as receiving holidays off. Um, and then we had uh, almost 3,400 responses. So for, I think, section one, a breakdown of the demographic questions, uh, Majority of my students who answered the questions age range from age 14 to age 15 and 16. So majority of the people who answer were either freshmen or sophomores. Uh, and 
majority of the schools that the students went to were uh, public uh, neighborhood schools or special admission schools. I believe uh, we had almost 200 students from Central, 200 students from Girls High, uh, 180 students from School of the Future, and 160 students as well from Overbrook High School. So key findings in the survey was, one of the questions I asked was, have you ever felt unsafe, unwelcome, or uncomfortable at your school because of your Muslim identity? And 1,860 students uh, responded yes. In addition to that question I asked, have you ever been bullied or mocked by your classmates or peers at school because you're a Muslim? And 1,600 students say yes. Um, with a follow-up question of the 1,600 students who answered yes, um, I asked, did they ever report the issue to school officials? 70% um, of the 1,600 students, in fact, did report it, but they believe that school officials didn't address the, didn't address the situation correctly. Then my last question was towards like, uh, with asking about Muslim treatment was, as a teacher, administrator, and other adult at your school made offensive comments about Islam or Muslims. Uh, 1,200 students were able to relate to this question and respond to yes, although a majority of them said no, that's still a significant number. Then we asked questions about, did your school provide you a sacred prayer room uh, to pray during Ramadan or exclude you? from being around a cafeteria or around people from eating. Uh, majority of the people who answered the survey, so 2,200 out of 3,300 students replied and said no. And then my last question is circled around the fact that the school district acknowledged that uh, it was a celebrated holiday and 1,800 students acknowledged that they received the wrong day off. And when they actually took this date off for what it was actually on, um, the absence wasn't excused and he actually was penalized for missing that day. So that was just a summary of the survey. And like the reason for doing the survey again was just to push out the student voice and acknowledge that um, students actually feel mistreated and that they're not actually aware of the certain type of certain type of requirements we have with praying or just having um, our student rights and just had not being known. Um, so based on the survey, uh, we also have a guide that we'll send out after Takao and you can probably send it to everyone. And it's also on our website, but it just uh, goes through like Islamic religious practices and ways you can support students. So that's uh, why we're here today. So one of the first, the, it kind of goes through different topics in Islam that you might hear of and kind of explain what those are and ways you can be accommodating. So the first thing is daily prayer. So Islam prescribes that people uh, perform prayer five times each day. So there's Fajr, which is at dawn, uh, Duhr, which is at noon, Asr in the afternoon, Maghrib is at dusk, and Isha is at nighttime. Um, the noon and afternoon prayer might fall within school uh, hours, especially the word that's normally around like lunchtime. Um, so that might be the prayer that students request to make the most um, while at school. And then Asr, which is normally, I think, norm around like dismissal or uh, if a student stays after school, that's when you might ask for hear that accommodation. Um, prayer also requires a ritual washing or wudu beforehand. And that's just like going to the bathroom, using the sink to like rinse your hands, mouth. Uh, arms, feet, just like a cleaning before prayer. Um, and then during the act of praying, uh, you do see someone praying. What you might see is that the Muslims, they recite the prayer either out loud or in silence. And then some actions are standing, bowing, and then touching your heads to the floor, to the ground, and facing towards the Kaaba Mecca. So if you walk in a room and a student's facing in like a funny direction based on the room, uh, that's why. Um, and then during the prayer, the worshiper is fully engaged and should not be interrupted. So this is also a thing that sometimes people encounter is if you walk in on someone praying and you might like call their name and they don't answer back right away. 
um, is not being rude. It's just um, kind of they're in the moment brain. Um, and we'll answer as soon as they're done. Uh, and then we have Zoom, which uh, in Islam, congregational worship is on Friday and it's, uh, it's worship on Fridays and mosque holds a midday prayer or sermon, which normally lasts approximately uh, one hour. Um, and then educators can accommodate students by providing a clean and quiet space for prayer. For example, if there's an unused classroom or if it is lunch hour and you, you're the only one like eating in your classroom, uh, maybe a student can come in there, pray for 10 minutes and then return back to lunch. Um, Muslim students, uh, you can allow them with a shorter break to pray. Um, if it is during that class time or lunch time, allowing them that time to be excused for like 10 minutes or so. Um, and then access to running water to perform will do. So if it is common that they have to go to the bathroom before praying, it's not like they're trying to make a trip around the classroom, around the school. It's just that uh, they're going to probably perform will do. And then uh, it extended lunch period. So the time that prayer comes in does change. Um, and like every day it goes like up in and up or back. And so um, that might also affect like when in the schedule it is. Uh, so just allowing them that time. Um, and then a temporary release to for students who wish to attend Juma. Um, this is something if anybody has been in the district for a long time, I know at one point that they were letting students go out for Juma. And this is something we're currently working with the school district on to just make sure that in the case that this does return, it's also in a safer way because there were problems with that before. Um, okay. Um, okay, so Ramadan and fasting. So Ramadan is the ninth month in the Islamic lunar calendar. Um, and then there's pre-calculations and then moon sighting. That's two things you might hear come up. Um, so pre-calculations with Ramadan, this is especially used for instances such as putting it on a school calendar. So you can kind of like pre-calculate when Ramadan might come in for when that it needs to have that like exact date. Um, but then there's also Ramadan is based on moon sightings. So there's also um, the moon wars as like some people call it. So there's people that follow it more locally and internationally. So some people believe like that you should sight the moon locally where you are. And then some people, so if it's for example, Philadelphia weather can sometimes be a little crazy. So you might not be able to sight the moon um, I think we sometimes people go with California and they're citing, but if they don't, then we won't fast. But then there's other people that will, if like Saudi Arabia, for example, does cite like the moon, they will. So if there's a difference in like some students come and fast on Monday and some fast on Tuesday, um, that could be why. Um, and then why do Muslims fast? Uh, so first it was commanded by God with the primary purpose to gain greater consciousness. Um, next is to increase one's spirituality and strengthen one's moral character, um, to appreciate food and drink uh, and develop empathy with those less fortunate than oneself, and then to practice self-control. So during Ramadan, we're uh, refraining from eating, drinking, smoking, and intimate contact from dawn to sunset. So it's not we're not, uh, not eating for the whole 30 days, it's uh, just while the sun is up. Um, and then working to increase personal restraint, proper conduct, and empathy. Uh, for example, with the less fortunate, so outside of just fasting, you'll see a lot of uh, giving to local charity and engagement with local projects. Um, so Ramadan fasting continues. So who should fast? So it's mandatory for healthy Muslim adults. Um, but fasting is not mandatory for children who have not reached puberty yet. Um, the elderly, pregnant, or breastfeeding women travelers or individuals who are physically or mentally incapable of fasting. Um, and then during this time, we ask that like you show sensitivity by uh, excusing some uh, Muslim students from strenuous activity if they are fasting. Um, some students do enjoy like playing sports and stuff while fasting. So of course that accommodation is to be to each individual student, um, allowing them to spend lunch time someplace else where others are not eating. Um, considering celebrating diversity by allowing students or a guest speaker to explain the traditions and practices of Ramadan. And we suggest this because it provides a learning opportunity and allows Muslim students to feel more comfortable fasting at school. Um, and then also refrain for, from judgment when someone isn't fasting. There are so many reasons why people can't fast. For example, like if uh, it's required that you're physically or mentally uh, capable of fasting. And so sometimes some illnesses you don't always see um, so at the end of the day, it's none of our business why someone isn't fasting, so just being mindful of that. Um, and then religious celebrations. So we have two major celebrations. We have Eid al-Fitr 
and Eid al-Adha. There's many other celebrations uh, in Islam, but these are the two main ones that you probably will hear of. Um, and then Eid al-Fitr is celebrated the day after the month of Ramadan. Um, so we'll conclude all of our fasting with Eid. Um, and then we have Eid al-Adha, which is celebrated on the 10th day of the 12th Islamic month of during the year. So during Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca, so you might also have some parents or families traveling uh, during that time. Um, and then typical festivities include the congregational prayer, uh, gatherings with family and friends, and then gifts and entertainment, especially for children. Um, and then schools should accommodate these celebrations by ensuring that students are not penalized for missing schools to celebrate these holidays. Again, just like how Ramadan is cited on the moon, so it's Eid. So you might have some students celebrate on one day and some celebrate on another day. And then it's not like anyone making anything up. It's um, just dependent on beliefs. Um, and then placing these holidays on school calendars so students and teachers are aware. Um, and then avoiding, if you're a teacher, avoiding scheduling major events on these days, for example, exams, presentation, presentations, major due dates, and field trips or class events. Um, we also have been in touch with College Board, who does AP exams, and then the PA Board of Education and gave them the estimated dates for IE uh, for the next few years. So basically they had agreed to plan to avoid them and we'll continue to check in with them. So from the like more local side, even making sure that your teachers um, try to avoid things during that week. Um, and then uh, again, opinions on mood signings differ. So please be respectful and understand that student, if you have students celebrating on different dates. Another thing is huge shout out to the Philadelphia School District. Uh, this is their upcoming calendar for 2024, and it's a great example calendar. So as you can see on the 10th of April, uh, they have the school is closed for students and staff, uh, and then administrative offices, um, and then also has important dates. So you know that Ramadan ends. Um, then on the uh, June 2024, you see Eid al-Adha. Um, as you can see, too, the last day of school is the 14th, so it is closed for administrative offices. But again, um, the dates are continuing to move up, so Eid al-Adha will continue to move into the school year, and that's an accommodation that may also be requested. Um, and then here at the bottom, they also highlight like important dates, and they just uh, indicate when Ramadan is, and they say that it's on the 11th, and it's just kind of just a good reminder like it's a, that it's on the calendar, and people can be aware of when it's coming in, and when students you might see that shift in students. So thank you for that. Um, and then we have personal modesty. So puberty is a major life turning point for all students. Um, and then Muslims believe that an emphasis on modesty encourages society to value individuals for their wisdom, skills, and contributions to the community rather than their physical attractiveness. Um, individuals interpret what that means for themselves uh, differently. Um, and that normally is according to cultural, ethic, or, uh, regional, or personal interpretations of modesty. Um, so men and boys may choose to wear clothing that covers from the navel to the knee, uh, wear a small head covering, uh, such as a kufi, um, and then maintain a beard that follows the example of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and then women often choose to wear loose fitting and now revealing clothes in public. Uh, they may wear a hijab or other head covering. Uh, some may wear a face veil, which is referred to as a niqab. Um, and then some individuals may choose to cover their body at all times, even and same gender locker room. So if you do receive, like for gym teachers, if you see someone that has to go to a bathroom that's even more separate, uh, that could be why. And then Islamic guidelines suggest that physical contact and being alone together should be discouraged between unmarried males and females. Um, so schools can help maintain personal interpretation of modesty by ensuring that students are not mocked and teased for their clothing choices. Um, allowing alternative clothing for physical, physical education. Um, so if your school has a uniform, gym uniform, sometimes a lot of that time is shorts and like a shirt. Uh, so accommodations, allowing accommodations to be made for that, um, including sports as well. Um, allowing private dressing and shower areas upon request. Um, and then being sensitive to the fact that female students who choose to wear hijab experience issues with other students. Um, so one in three, uh, Students report having their hijab tugged, pulled, or offensively touched. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Um, and then gender relations. Uh, try not to extend a hand purse and handshakes with members of different genders. 
Um, sometimes it's just like the awkward moment depending on people's interpretation of religious modesty. Uh, they may not like uh, females may not shake males hands and vice versa. So it's not like a being rude thing. Uh, it's just something to keep in mind based on their personal modesty. Um, and then avoid touching when comforting students and parents of different genders. Okay, and then dietary requirements. So Muslims um, refrain from consuming alcohol, pork, and any by pork products or derivatives. Um, for example, pork, including pepperoni, um, sausages, hot dogs, or bacon. Uh, they do have like beef and turkey products of this. Um, animal shortening, gelatin, including jello and gummy bears, or worms, lard, and then ingredients containing alcohol, such as vanilla extract and Dijon mustard. Um, some Muslims also choose to adhere to a halal zabiha diet, uh, standard for their meat and poultry slaughter and preparation. So halal basically means uh, permissible. So there's also that difference in if you see some Muslims may choose to eat like the chicken at lunch and then some other, they're like, they can't eat that. So that's kind of where that distinction lies. So halal, the people that say that it's halal is just permissible, it may just mean that as long as it's not pork or alcohol, that it's permissible. Um, then the Zabiha diet is more of, it has to be uh, slaughtered in a, stand, in a certain uh, way. Um, and that's where that kind of difference lies. Um, schools and educators can accommodate students by, um, Indicating with a clear and age appropriate marker if a food contains pork or any five pork product. And then schools can also, with a higher number of Muslims, can also consider the demand for halal food and offer it alongside of other options such as kosher or vegan uh, to support other uh, students. And then we have curriculum issues. So um, there's a continued use of outdated material, especially in social studies and world history classes and schools all over the world. Um, and that reinforces perceptions of Islam uh, as a foreign creed and Muslims as enemies. Um, there's a large availability of accurate and balanced instructional material and it, it is increasing. Um, and we even have some on our website. Um, and then Islam puts an emphasis on modesty, chastity, morality and thus there's a specific, specific teaching set of teachings with regard to human development and related issues. Um, so schools should notify parents of these lessons and allow parents to review the course materials in advance and honor uh, parents written requests should they choose to opt out for their children. Um, and then we have the Pledge of Allegiance. So while Islam prescribes respect for the country and the local laws, it also discourages acts of reverence to anything or anyone but God. Um, so some students, may, some Muslim students may choose to opt out of the pledge, and it shouldn't be interpreted as a sign of disrespect or lack of patriotism. Um, and then, so schools can ensure an inclusive learning environment by, um, the schools can have materials reviewed for bias by qualified Muslim educators. If you have a question about uh, a certain material, you can reach out to us at CARE, or there's many other uh, people we can refer you to. Um, and the PA Board of Education is also a great resource. Um, educators could consider and bring in, in a Muslim speaker to teach about Islam in order to ensure the lessons are well informed, um, encourage class discussion that embraces diversity, tolerance, and in an inclusive classroom environment, um, allowing parents reasonable time to review any uh, material pertaining to or with respect to sex education. Um, and then educators respect the decisions of Muslims and other students who may not re want to recite the Pledge of Allegiance in accordance with their First Amendment rights. All right, I don't know if I might end it faster than I thought, but if anybody has any questions, yeah. well, thank you. And then you can reach out to me. Here's my email if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Asia and George. Uh, we definitely are grateful for this presentation, um, and I'm sure I will serve as a guide for the SDP community and beyond. Um, at this time, I want to just open the floor for a few questions, if you have them on the spot. Uh, so feel free to come off mute uh, and ask away. I guess my question would be, when it comes to the calendar piece and making sure like we properly observe the holidays. So just from my understanding from what you presented, like things move based on the, the position of the moon. So we could have something on the calendar, but then that might 
it might change, right? Yes, that happened okay, so, uh, last school year, actually. Um, I think last school year, uh, it was a specific date that was already estimated, and the school district went off of that. But it ended up being a day. It ended up being a day before, and that's why students took off on an extra day, and they actually got penalized for it as an unexcused absence. So we also do like provide that like uh, time gap, and normally it's only a uh, one to like one to three day difference if it is. Um, so it just be a mindful, especially as some students have different beliefs on the moon sighting. So if you have one student that's like, oh yeah, eat it today, and the other students like, oh no, it's tomorrow. Like just being mindful of that and giving them that accommodation. Um, the calendar, we know that it's hard to face anything when you don't like the night before. That would be like, uh, I don't even know how that will work the day if we had to tell you guys the day before. Um, as far as getting off, but the the district day that's off. Everyone will have off, but if a student is asking for accommodation the day before or after, just be mindful of that as well. So we just ask that avoiding things during that like time period in general is preferred if you can. Okay, thank you. It kind of helped me understand it a little better. Do we have any other questions for CARE? I actually have a question and thank you for this informative presentation. You named a lot of the areas where uh, there should be some attention paid to, particularly as people are observing Ramadan. But if you had to give some additional thought around how staff members or peers could support their colleagues um, as they're in observation of Ramadan, how would you capture that? What are the like top three, if there are things that are like, this is what you absolutely should do. How should you conduct yourself? Yeah, I think just being mindful that at the time, like people aren't eating during that time. So if you see a staff member that's normally like very, very perky all the time and they're more kind of just like in a bad moment, um, just being mindful of that and kind of just know what, letting them know that you're there to support um, in any way possible. Um, also, just being mindful of what Ramadan is. I think like some people are okay with the questions of like, you can't even drink water or something like that. But then for some people, it's kind of like, no, we can't. And having to like re-explain that. So kind of just like educating yourself on, yes, they're not eating and this is why. So they don't have to continuously explain themselves. And um, three, I don't know, I'm trying to think of another one. I don't know if Ahmed or George, you have another uh, suggestion. Yeah, just be mindful. You don't have your regular caffeine <laughs> during Ramadan. I, I can be a bit hangry and it's like, you know, feeling the, the lo loss of caffeine. Um, um, and yeah, so um, I think one of the other things that I've seen uh, that has worked is, and of course, like a lot of the times, this falls on the BCAs, right, to help support students, to help support like, you know, families uh during ramadan um so maybe like you know trying to be helpful to them um as much as possible uh extending hands perhaps um, um that that will be that will be important um and finally i think like this this is maybe a step forward but there might be opportunities to visit uh the area institutions mosques during ramadan because every evening Right, so it's, it's the busiest time of the year. There is often shared meals um, uh, and all. We are encouraging our mosques to invite their community to their gatherings as well. But, you know, you might want to be also a little bit like you know, proactive and maybe seek out an engagement um, as well. Often you will find many communities are very happy to host uh, members of other faith traditions or non faith traditions uh, host during Ramadan, share a meal. Um, and just like join in the celebratory uh, as well. Thank you. Also, just as an Ahmed, he's our executive director over our care. So. Do we have any more questions at this time? 
Can I ask a question around what Asiya highlighted on the, the textbooks um, uh, and, and one dynamic maybe like that I want to mention is that you want to be also, I think like, you know, it's, it's difficult for us, us for educators. Uh, we want to make students part of the, the discussion and especially when talking about the page, maybe like, you know, ask them to share and which can be great, but be mindful also that that point students feel like now they have like the whole pressure of talking about their whole faith and even sometimes even having to talk about misconceptions for which they may be prepared or not so like you know being a little bit more conversant on that ahead of time rather than doing it on the spot uh, might be helpful for uh, for students um, um, that's that's something that I've seen a few cases where teachers shared hey uh, you know, I invited the student and they were very happy to do it. But in another case, a teacher might say, hey, I invited a student that it's, I felt like, you know, they were struggling. Um, and and they did put like undue uh, burden on them. And sometimes students share with us that, um, that it might feel a little bit tricky to, for example, speak to misconceptions about like Muslim women, right? So on spot, you might or might not be prepared to fully speak to uh, to that so it's kind of like you know feeling the the room and maybe ahead of time some conversations might be um best practice on those um situations thank you for that Ahmed. uh and i was also thank you again to uh Asiya, uh and george for your time and insight um it was, it was a great session we really appreciate the time um, we're excited to continue working hand in hand with CARE Philadelphia for sure. Um, before we depart, I just have a few quick announcements and updates. Um, so Equity in Practice is a monthly series and we look to continue that throughout the year. Uh, and next month uh, will be Arab Heritage Month. Uh, so for that month, we are welcoming uh, Abu Stan, Seeds of Culture, uh, which is a community organization in Philadelphia offering arts, education, and advocacy programs to promote a better understanding and a deeper appreciation for Arab cultures, uh, experiences, histories, and modern realities. Uh, so in that session, our friends at Abu Stan will, be, will explore best practices just around integration and celebration of SDP students, families, and community members uh, who have Arab culture, uh, who have Arab, Arab heritage, excuse me, and shared experiences with Arab cultures in the schools and beyond. Uh, so please be on the lookout for that flyer and registration link uh, in the coming weeks. We would love to have you join us. Um, and also as well, uh, Abu San Sees the Culture also offers um, a host of educational resources for educators in the community at large regarding some of the Islamic holidays, which includes the month of Ramadan, which is approaching. Uh, in our final moments here, I uh, just wanted to yield some time to Shima uh, at Abu Stan, who serves as the edu education manager uh, to just share a little bit more about those resources. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody at CARE for such an informative and beautiful presentation and for doing so much of the work that we need in the community. Um, and thank you all for being here today and being part of that. Um, I wanted to add like in relation to today's topic that uh, being at Albustan, uh, we get a lot of requests to talk about certain cultural topics or come into classrooms. We do a lot of work in the school district around issues that connect by a way or another to Arab and Middle Eastern cultures. And Islam and Muslim experiences intersect with that a lot, even though not everybody in the Arab world is Muslim, but definitely the Muslim culture celebrations and folklore are a big part of the, um, the Arab cultures. Uh, we were actually approached by several schools and staff at schools recently to do programs specifically around Ramadan from educators and from bilingual counselor assistants. So it's good to know and see that there are individual efforts at least coming from uh, individual schools because they see a need. And I think it is nice to kind of um, offer support like district wise to tell them like we're working with organizations who can provide some of these resources for you to kind of lift that burden from them. Um, but in that uh, regard, we wanted to say that we have curriculum materials and craft and art ideas, um, packages that we can provide for either um, teachers to use in their classroom or as professional development. 
uh, specifically for social studies, English as a second language, and some um, um, are some art classes. So if anybody's interested in collaborating in these areas, um, I'm more than happy to connect with you. Um, I can share my email address, or if you can find um, our contact information on Albustan's website, and we would be happy to talk with you more about that. Thank you so much for that. And I see Ahmed also mentioned that they have also resources um, for educators in the community as well. Um, so if you came late to this session today, um, feel free. Uh, I'll be sending out the presentation if it's okay with CARE, um, just for educators to have uh, the slideshow. Uh, and also these videos will be available on our website. So I'll be sending out an email as well once it's posted on our website for your review and if you wanna share with a colleague. But uh, we're done for now. Thank you so much, everyone, for stopping by, and we hope to see you next month. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.